here, Sister Francis, good to have you here. It's good to see you every morning today. Ezra chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13. I'm going to read in your hearing a little extended passage here, but I think it's one that's going to be relevant for us. It says, when the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Josedach, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the Feast of, Bo Feast of Booths, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule, as each day required. And after the regular burnt offerings, the offering at the new moon, and all the appointed feasts of the Lord, and offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. From that first day of the seventh month, this is in the sixth verse, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation, notice this here, of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. But now in the second year, after they're coming to the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. <laughs> They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua with his sons and his brothers, and Cadmiel with his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And notice this, and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions David, king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. This is really where the sermon's at here in verse 12 to 13. But when but many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses Old men who had seen the first house wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. I want to emphasize verse 13, that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping, for the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. I want to talk today, just for a few minutes, he's giving you one more chance. He's giving you one more chance. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to know today that you've given us one more chance. Lord, we don't deserve to be here right now, but your grace and mercy has not run out on us. And God, just to know that you had enough for us, enough love, enough care, enough compassion, Despite what we've done this week to allow us to be here today, we're glad to know that you've kept us one more day. Amen. And Lord, you were trying to do something with us to mold us into your image more. And we know it's a tedious journey, Lord, but we're thankful that despite the hiccups that we've had, you've been with us along the way. Lord, we just ask in this moment, as we go into your word, that our hearts and our minds and our ears be open to what you were trying to tell us today. I know it's not a coincidence, it's not happenstance, but Lord, this is a divine opportunity for us to be here today. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. In honor of Black History, last week I opened up with talking about Martin Luther King, but I, I wanted to reflect on someone that is familiar to this area at one point, but became a national success. And when I was thinking of this passage, particularly, I thought of the term rebound. Rebound is the interesting term that's going to be implied here within the passage. But when thinking about rebound, I thought about somebody that's in the sport that I love the most, or that was in the sport that I love the most, and his name was Bill <coughs> Russell. And Bill Russell's birthday is actually on February 12th, which is actually the day after mine, which is tomorrow. And, and Bill Russell was somebody that in the NBA, he was known for getting rebounds, Sister Jones, to the point that 
One season, he averaged 25 rebounds per game. That may not seem like a lot, but even the great rebounders that there are even currently, the more athletic, the bigger, the ones that are able to move faster, more powerful, most of them do not average 25 rebounds, mostly around 10 to 13 rebounds per game. Bill Russell, during that time, he was known for his rebounding and his defense. This rebounding is important because, Brother Gibbons, rebounds during that game would give the team another chance. It's when you would have a missed shot, Sister Merrill, that would go and ricochet off of the rim. Bill Russell would come out of nowhere and would grab the ball and give the team another chance. It's when you thought that something was going to go well, the layup that you had, Sister Jones, that open shot that you had, and, and just like an embarrassing move, just because you thought it was going to go in, it didn't go in, but there is Bill Russell to clean up the rebound. And this is the essence of who Bill Russell is, but honestly, Bill Russell is a reflection of what's happening in your life. Bill Russell is a reflection of on a constant, consistent nature. You have put up shots, if you will. You have made attempts, if you will. You have done things thinking that you had the open spot, but then it ricochets. You miss. It, something doesn't work out. But then somehow, Brother Gibbons, God is always there to rebound you. Now, this doesn't seem that important, but if you understand what is in that term of rebound and you look at what bound really means, bound, if you go through the Webster's Dictionary, you know that it can be used in many different forms, but one of the forms, Sister Denise, is that it can be used as a noun. And when you're talking about someone being bound, it means that they were destined for a specific place. They were going a specific direction. They were going a specific trajectory on their life. But being bound to that way, being bound in that direction, something has happened. That prefix comes in. You have been rebounded. Emphasizing that, that now you have been brought to a different direction. You have been brought again and again. You have been relinquished from the place that you were going to go. And it's in your life most of the time that you have been rebounded. I know it might not be something that moves on your heart this morning, but the fact that you are here right now, Adrian, is a sign that you've been rebounded. 20, 30, 40 years ago, you would have never thought, Sister Hudson, that your life would be here today, but, but God rebounded you. He, he, he took you from the place that you were going to be going, and he somehow reclaimed you, repossessed you, gave you a new identity, gave you another chance. And it's that testimony here today. Maybe it's just me this morning where I could lift my hands and be able to say, thank you, God, for another chance. Because if it was not for the other chances that I may not have had at different times, I may still be stuck in places or stuck doing things or maybe dead right now because of some of the actions that I had taken before. But God saw fit within his grace and his mercy, despite the sorry carcasses that we can be at times, that he allowed for his grace and mercy to be poured upon us. And year after year, time after time, week after week, month after month, day after day, there is a rebound that happens in your life. Uh, you ricocheted, you, you bounced off of the walls, you went somewhere that you did not plan to go. But Sister Merrill, somehow his hands and his arms are wide enough to catch you every time. Now, somehow he is open enough for you to be able to come into his arms. And no matter where you have been, no matter where you are going, God has saw fit. His blood was cosmopolitan enough to see where you have been, see what you have done. And yet he has grabbed you every time. And you're here to be able to say, thank you, God, for another chance. It's another chance that he's given to you. It's our people that have come through so much and yet he has given us chances and chances and chances. And just like the old saints would say, God, I'm just <laughs> thankful that your grace and mercy has stuck by my side because I don't know where I would be without your grace and mercy on my side. Yeah. But it's, it's in that testimony, Sister Hudson, that I want to challenge us here because... While that is familiar for us today to know that we've been given another chance, it's also familiar for the Jews at this time. Uh, you understand what has happened for the Jews because it's something that has happened for us too, that, that God has allowed certain things to happen. And, and in allowing certain things to happen, what God did was back in 586 BC, he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come upon and put these people into captivity. 
And while putting them into captivity, they did not understand why God was allowing this thing to happen. But God, within his sovereign will, Brother Gibbons, understood that his people were not acting and being the way that he wanted them to be. So somehow within his divine wisdom, he allowed them to go into captivity. And in this space of being in this Babylonian empire, Kelly, they, they start to realize that they don't have their identity anymore. <coughs> Things that they used to do, they don't do anymore. Things that they were accustomed to, they don't do anymore. Now they have lost the sense of the identity that they had with the Hebrew God. But it's in this space, it's in this time that's important because in Ezra chapter 1, the Bible says here that in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. That notice this here, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah. This is important. Brother Ben, he reflected upon it earlier because notice this here. This is a pagan king that the Lord has just spoken to. Oh, you missed that right there. That, that in this moment that when the Israelites, the Jews, the people of God are in captivity, God speaks to someone that is not like them in order to get them back on course. Now, this is important here because Cyrus has been raised up. He has taken power and God comes to him and Sister Meryl, he stirs up this pagan king spirit. And when he stirs up this pagan king spirit, notice what's said here, that the proclamation that comes from Cyrus's mouth is not that he's just going to send them back to Jerusalem. No, 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 no. I'm not sending you back to your place just to go, Sister Denise. I'm sending you back to rebuild I'm sending you back to lay a new foundation. I'm sending you back because something has to be reinstituted. And while Cyrus is thinking about the, the, the essence of his kingdom and how prolific it might look to other people, God is concerned about his people having a specific mission. In fact, God is saying right now that it's not about you just going back to the place where you were comfortable. It's not about you going back to the place where you understood things. No, there is a mission that you have at this time. And this is where Cyrus comes about because the Lord stirs up his spirit and he sends his proclamation out that the people must go back and notice this here because God is giving them another chance. See, see, it's in your life that you have failed at the opportunities that God has given you. It's in your life. Maybe y'all don't want to be honest. It's 930 in the morning. You're just saying, oh, no, 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 that doesn't happen to me. But it's in your life that you have seen that God has given you another chance. Yeah. And every time that God gives you another chance, isn't it interesting that you end up in the same spots a lot of times, wondering why am I doing the same thing? Over and over and over again. Albert Einstein, there's many different def definitions for it. But he gave the best definition, I think, for it when he said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And it's interesting, Alan de Botton, the, the great philosopher, the Swiss philosopher, he talked about that if you have not learned anything from the year prior, that you are failing yourself every day. If you think that you, who you were right now, is not something that has been brought up through your consistent bad habits or your consistent bad nature, and you, presently as you are, is just something that has just woke up and you just became like this, you've got to check yourself at the door and understand that there is a legacy of habits that have led you to this place. There's a legacy of behavior that has led you to this spot. But yet God, somehow, Sister Francis, keeps on giving you another chance. Knowing that you keep on doing the same thing. Now, 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 now we got to understand this here. If God is consistently giving us another chance, why is he giving us another chance? And yet why are we always ending up in the same spot? This is what I want to challenge you here today with just four movements. And I'm out of here because I, I, we don't have much time. But I want to challenge this here because I believe God is giving you another chance in your life. In fact, right now, I know that since you are here in this building, in your life, right now on a personal note, God should have left you out there. But somehow in his goodness and his grace and his mercy, 
He's given you another chance. Some of you should have been dead. Some of you should have been in places that you don't even want to be or think of right now. But God's given you another chance. And it's within this other chance. How do you then steward this new opportunity? How do you actually move in the direction, Brother Jones, in order for this chance to now be taken, in order for you to be rebounded? How do you actually score this time? How do you keep on doing the same thing, but now you want to adjust? This is important because the first thing you got to understand is that when God gives us a second chance, unity is something that you've got to embrace. Uh, uh, notice this here in the text here. It says in Ezra chapter 3 verse 1 that when the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Oh, this is this is important because as soon as they are broken free, if you will, Brother Ben, as soon as they are set free, the objective is, Sister Merrill, not to be independent in any way. The objective is for them to now come together. Hear me on this now, that the Bible talks about this idea of us having unity because he knows, Jesus knows, that all of us are different people. But in order for you to be able to get to the place or to do exactly what God wants you to do, you cannot act independently from the people around you. Now this is important, I don't know if it's true, but they say that when spiders unite, they can tie down a lion. I think y'all just missed what I just said. When, when spiders unite, they can tie down a lion. What would it look like, Adrian, if the people of God were uniting? What, what would it look like? What could be accomplished if people actually came together? I'm not talking about that all of us understand the same things. I'm not talking about that all of us agree on the same things. I'm not talking about that all of us look the same way, act the same way, eat the same way. I'm talking about it's the idea of what is the mission? What's the objective? What are we supposed to be doing? The idea is, Sister Hudson, that God has given you another chance so that you don't rehearse the same thing, the same independency, the same independent thought that you had before that got you in that place that he had to rescue you from. God is saying right now that there is an opportunity that I'm giving to you. Why? Because I want you to exercise something that you're not comfortable with. I'll admit it. I don't like working with people. Because if I can do it myself, Sister Denise, I'll do it. But, but the idea is that you cannot reach certain successes in your life unless you got somebody to help you. I'll share it this way, that, that when I was learning my multiplication table, Sister Merrill, you know my mom very well, and you understand that that woman can be crazy at times. And, and that, that woman made sure that when I came to her and I was saying that I wanted to go outside and play basketball and do all this different stuff, but she saw my report card, Sister Jones, and saw that I wasn't passing math class, what she decided to do was we were going to spend time after school, in the summer, and before I could go outside, I had to be doing my multiplication tables. I come back one summer, and I'm beating everybody in the class, just whooping everybody at these multiplication tables. Why? Because somebody helped me. Yeah. And this becomes the problem for many of us in here, myself included. We don't like having to work together. Because the idea of that is, I can't be independent. But let me just help you and understand this, that God says right now that the opportunity that is in front of us is not one where you have to work independently. It's one where you must come together because in order for the mission to come together, you've got to work together. But this is important here because not only just in this sense that, that there is the idea of independence. In fact, Harry Truman says it this way. He says, it is amazing what can be accomplished when nobody cares who gets the credit. It's amazing what could be done if people aren't seeking awards and credit and validation and just seeking exactly fulfilling what God has called them to do within their churches. But this is important because when God gives a second chance, not only is unity something that we've got to embrace, but the goal that we're trying to get after, Sister Hudson, can't be more important than the one that has given us the goal. The goal can't be more important than the one that has given us the inspiration. The goal can't be more important than the one that has given us the vision. The one that we must worship is not the place that we're going, is not the thing that we're doing, but it has to be the one that has given us the actual idea. 
I'll notice this here. You think I'm just saying this. Notice in verse 2 through 5. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Josedek, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they, notice this, and they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them, because the peoples of the land, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. All of that just to say that their first objective, Sister Jones, when they got out of here, was not to start building, but to consecrate themselves. Oh, man, I wish y'all were here and alive with me on this. Because the objective is for the people at this time, we're coming together. And what we know is that we've got a mission. But the thing that's more important than the mission is the one that gave us the mission. The one that gave us the, the, the energy, the one that gave us the inspiration. In fact, you've seen people that have been so obsessed with the things of God, but not of God. You've seen people obsessed with doing the work, but yet have not allowed that work to be done upon them. God is saying right now, I must be the priority still. I, I must still be central to everything that is going on. Because if I'm not, then you're going to make an idol out of the mission. You're going to make an idol out of activity. You're going to make an idol out of the building. You're going to make an idol out of the work. You're going to make an idol out of all of these positions. But God is saying, can't I be the focus and the central point of this? I've given you another chance for you to realize that it's not you that got yourself here. So work with other people. But it's also the fact that you've got to understand that I'm the one that brought you here and I'm the one that will take you out. And this is where God becomes uncomfortable for us. Why? Because God is not obsessed with us doing. He's obsessed with us being. I know that you didn't get that right there. That went across your head. You're saying, what does that mean? You are catching on Thursday. Why? Because many of us do the work. Many of us do Christian things. But many of us cannot be Christians within our hearts. Because that takes a surrender and keeping him at the focus and the center of our hearts and of our lives. And while we may be baptizing, while we may be preaching, while we may be singing, going door to door, many of our hearts are still disturbed because we have not allowed that work to be done upon us. And this is what God presents you. He says, I've given you a new opportunity, Sister Merrill, because I don't want you to think that you need to work by yourself. No, you need to be working with people, but then also you need to understand that I must stay central. Before you lay the first stone, before you do anything, you must understand the habit of this is the most important thing, worshiping the God that has given us the gift. Amen. This is important still because God gives us that second chance. Unity must be something that we embrace. The, the goal can't be more important than the goal giver. But, but Sister Jones, you cannot be afraid of receiving help. Now notice this here. When you talk about receiving help, many people are thinking about, man, just somebody that's around them that they're comfortable with. But notice this here in the passage. This is good for me, that the Bible describes it in this way. In Ezra chapter 3, verse 6, from the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. Notice this. The foundation of the temple was not yet laid. So you have the imagery here that they have been worshiping God. But their mission, as far as coming to build this thing, has not come together yet. But notice the gap here, Sister Hudson, on what they do. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters. And food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the grant that they have from Cyrus, king of Persia. Can I just forward on this? Understand that Cyrus gives them money for something that he doesn't even participate in. The pagan king. That they now finance this whole foundation to be done by people that are not even like them. They, they now send money out to Lebanon to hire people to come in to get what the Lord has required for them to get done. And why am I bringing this up? Because what you run into is understanding that there's got to be people that are not eating like you, talking like you, smelling like you, acting like you, that are going to be able to help you to be able to do what the Lord wants you to do. Now, Ella Ben said it really well before. I, I didn't commission him to say it very at this moment, so don't feel like I was pulling on his, his coattail to say this thing in any way. But many of us will become so recluse and so important to ourselves. As my mom would say, we just start smelling ourselves so much. 
Because we will think that nobody can come in here and teach us anything. And nobody can help us in any way. Because if they don't know haystacks, if they don't know adventurers, if they don't know pathfinders, if they don't know this, they don't know that, they don't know GC, they don't know the Passover. If they don't know like us, then they can't help us. But the text just said that the people of God, through God's own commission, had to go outsource some people to help them accomplish the mission that God had for them. And it leaves us with a question in our mind. Maybe we end up in the same places because we keep using the same people. Maybe we end up in the same habits because we don't think that we can branch outside to get anybody else in. But notice, Brother Jones, if they don't reach out to people for help, the mission does not get accomplished. If they don't look beyond their four walls, if they don't look beyond their eyesight, if they don't look beyond their perception, they're going to be stuck in the same place. And isn't it familiar to us, Adrian, the idea of us being stuck in the same places, seeing the same people doing the same things, but yet, yet, yet we, we may not always want to bring people in because we're afraid of what they're going to do to us. We're afraid of something that they're going to say. We're afraid of how they're going to act in some type of way. But, but God is saying these are the people that can help us be what he's called us to be. I know y'all silent on me today. I don't know if this is a good, bad word or what, but I'm, pre I'm appreciating it. The idea that God has given us another chance. But this isn't it, though. Because Sister Mero, you've encouraged me with this as well. And I want you to see this here. Because unity must be something that you've got to embrace. The goal can't be more important than the goal giver. You can't be afraid of the outside help that is available. But, but this is what you've got to do. Sister Jones, this is what you've got to do. In the, the tough times of life, you've got to understand this principle here. You've got to see through the noise. Now, now y'all are smart people. Y'all notice at this moment that I said see through the noise. And you know that you hear with your ears. And you see with your eyes. And in order for you to know that there's noise, you got to hear it. And in order for you to be able to see something, you got to have eyes. But I just brought that together to say you've got to be able to see through the noise. But I want you to see this here. And then we're out. In verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests and their vestments came forward with trumpets. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And notice, don't miss this. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shout with a great shout when they praise the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord was laid. But Brother Ben, notice this. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping, for the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Uh, can I just help you here and understand that, that everybody was helping to build this thing? But when the thing was complete, Sister Merrill, and people saw the results. Some people, Sister Hudson, were praising the Lord. And other people started complaining because it didn't look like what they used to look like. But notice the poetic part of this, Brother Jones, that both sides were so loud that you couldn't distinguish what was praise or what was cries. Because sometimes in life, and let me just help you here, you have to see through everything that you hear. You got to look past everything that you're talking about. I've told y'all before that compliments can be just as dangerous as insults. That things can get so high for you that you start smelling yourself and things get so low that you start thinking so bad of yourself. But right now, the people are praising God because there's a foundation and there's some others that are just upset because it does not look exactly the way that they wanted it to look. And notice this here. At this moment, who are the ones that are complaining? It's the Levites and the priests and the heads of the houses, the old men who had seen the first house. It's, it's people that are in the church. 
that are complaining about what they are seeing. And it's people that are in the church that are praising about what they are seeing. And all of it is just noise. All of it becomes noise. This is why this is important, Adrian. Why? Because whenever you've been given a new opportunity, there are going to be people that say, you've got to do it this way. There's going to be people that say, you've got to do it this way. And here's where I'm trying to help us understand. All of it becomes noise because the Lord has given you a commission on what you're supposed to do. Some people will like it. Some people won't like it. And then you still got to do what the Lord wanted you to do. You've been in situations where you stopped because of what everybody else was saying. You've been in situations because what your parents may have told you to do. You've been in situations where what your family may have told you to do. You've been in situations because of what your job people may have told you to do. But, but sometimes you have to look past what everybody is saying and remember exactly what God has done. He has given you another chance. Now, this is good. This is really good for us. Why? Because it wasn't just shown here with the Jewish people. But, but it was also inspired through the prophecy that, that when Jesus came, he came as the Son of Man, as Luke describes in Luke 19, 10, that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which were lost. But, but you understand that when he was this baby, that, that Herod had been influenced at that time to take all these kids out because there was this kid that was now the king of the Jews. But, but, then, but then this kid grows up and, and he gets baptized and the devil himself wants to take him out by displaying all his divinity. And he says, just turn this stone into bread. Just jump off of this cliff and I'll just give you this thing. It's, it's what's going through his head at this time. But, but then this same Jesus, Sister Joan, he, he goes along this tedious journey. And one day while he's healing all of these people and he's doing all of these great things, people are getting fed. His disciples come to him and say, you need to coordinate yourself as king. And it's all just noise. And he has to retreat to his father and go and pray. But then when he moves further on, he comes to this specific place one week away from his crucifixion. And it's impressive here, Sister Francis, because while he's going down that path, there's people with palm trees literally saying at that time, and they're literally saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And it's all just noise because those same people are the same ones that say crucify him of flesh. Just a couple of days later. What do you do? When you've been given another chance, what are you doing now that God has given you another chance? Are you going to do the same thing that you did before and get the same results? Or are you looking at this time that God has rebounded you? Because let me just help you here. If he did not rebound you, the other team would have taken possession of you. And let's just help you here. If he did not save your life, if he did not die on the cross for you, there would be no hope for you at this time. So what are you going to do to steward the opportunity that now he's giving you a new opportunity? Anybody just thankful for his grace? Anybody just thankful for his mercy? And seeing fit for you to be given a new opportunity. But you've got to know that you can't work independently of people. You've got to know that you're going to need help from people. You're going to know that you've got to stay upon the mission, but you can't allow the mission, you can't allow the goal to be more important than the one that gave you the goal. Folks, you, you can't allow what everybody says to deter you exactly from what the Lord has told you to do. Here's my challenge to you. As a Christian in this place, are you going to make another lap in your life around the same stuff that you've been going through for the past 20, the 25 years, 30, the 45 years, where you've been practicing the same habits? Are you going to say today, you know what? I'm sick of this. I'm tired of being tired. I'm sick of being sick. I've got to do something different because God has given me another opportunity. And I've got to maximize on this opportunity here today. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're grateful just to know 
that you've given us another chance. But it's within us getting another chance that we realize we have another <coughs> responsibility once again. And our responsibility is to act with our ability and the will that you have for us. That's meaning that we, we've got to be unified. That means that we, we've got to be okay with getting help. We've got to be okay with making sure that the main thing is the main thing, and that's you. But Lord, if we, if we veer from this, we end up in the same spots that we were in years before. We end up in the same cycle that we've been in time and time again. But God, you are calling out to us because you were saying, I have rebounded you. You were destined for a specific place, but I reclaim you. God, I'm thankful this morning to know that we have been reclaimed by you. That we have been rebounded by you. But Lord, help us to be able to score at this time by being stewards to this opportunity that we have in front of us. God, I don't know what's happening in the personal lives of all of us here today. But what I can testify to is that if we are able to inhale and exhale, that we are able to say, God, I'm able to get here to this place today. You have given us another chance. And if you've given us another chance, Lord, we're saying through the power of your Holy Spirit, we do not want to be in the same place, in the same spot, in the same situation again. We want something new to come about. And Lord, help us to keep you at the focus of everything that we are doing. Why? Because we don't want the goal, we don't want the mission, we don't want the division to become more important than you. Because we want to stay in relationship with you. Be with us. Challenge us here today. And give us your Holy Spirit that's necessary for us to walk out of these doors with a new insight and a new mission and a new attitude, knowing that he's given us another chance. We've got to move forth in the way that he wants us to go. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys blessed by that message here today.